So hello everybody, uh, my name is Jonas Kovanoglu. Um, I am working as a, a I'm a working student uh, at LMU right now. I'm uh, start doing my math masters at TU in Munich. And um, yeah, I'm working with uh, Professor Jimenez. Um, and um, today I'm going to also talk about OCR. I think this talk is going to be a smooth transition. There's going to be some things that are going to be repeated, but yeah. Um, so, but before I uh, talk about OCR, I wanted to briefly mention the EBL project. So the EBL project uh, that I was a part of since 2019 um, uh, is uh, basically uh, organized and by Professor Jimenez. He um, received the European Research Council grant of 1.65 million euros for the project. It started 2018. And uh, it launched basically a couple of weeks ago, uh, but I think most uh, astrologists already had um, access to it. So anybody here uh, who, who has heard of the project um, already, maybe? Okay, a lot of people. That's good, that's good. Um, and I wanted to take this chance to briefly talk about it uh, anyway. Uh, so my, the first part is going to demonstrate some of the features. I myself am not an astrologist, so I'll... Um, yeah, I'll try to stay as conservative as possible on that topic, but um, my second part is going to be about the OCR. And um, yeah, so first about the, the EBL project. So my main work was uh, working on this website, basically as a web developer. And um, yeah, there are different things that you can do. Um, so there were, I think, around four astrologists, postdocs, and PhD students working. Um, within the, those three years, they transliterated 21,000 tablets. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you can, for example, uh, we can sh look at what was recently transliterated right here. Um, exactly, so we uh, implement an ATF parser, so there's an extension and backward compatible to ATF. Then, and you can see here, there's uh, different folios, for example. Um, we parse the ATF um, in text form, and then we ha have a kind of neat display right here. We have the limitization. And um, we also have an annotation tool. Uh, I think, as far as I know, there are at least three annotation tools out there. There's another, from, uh, another one from Heidelberg. And this was uh, mainly used to annotate the data. Um, then there are, there, I mean, you can search for signs, for example, for compound graphemes, for example, also. Maybe let's just stick with the... So here, yeah, you have the sign information. Um, we have the, the meaning, we have the translation, um, we have the different homophones, we have the composite uh, signs, and uh, much more, as you can see here. Um, so here you can see the paleography. This is also basically a side effect of making annotations for the OCR. You can display them right here. And we recently added the Fossi Manuel d'Astrologie. Um, I think Shai was also uh, part of digi digitizing uh, some parts of this book um, from Borger. Yes. So, um, yeah, this is just a small fraction. I and mean, we have, you can search for transliterations. I mean, um, you can search for uh, co-occurring uh, readings. You can search for uh, different readings, uh, which are within like uh, two lines. Um, and there are different kind of uh, yeah, different options that you can um, that you can have, and this, uh, in my opinion, is also a nice demonstration for where OCR could be really, 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 be uh, really beneficial. So right here, you can see that only transliterated fragments will show up, and having a decent OCR message uh, would make it possible so that um, even untransliterated fragments uh, could be uh, included in this query, and this would make it possible for finding joints, for finding um, yeah, uh, relevant, uh, undiscovered um, fragments or tab uh, tablets that um, could be matched with um, important texts and so on. Um, all right, I will conclude now the, this section to the EBL. Uh, I'll invite you to try it out. 
And um, if you're interested, there are many, many more features, but I think I'll try to keep it short and move on to the um, OCR section. So uh, I wanted to discuss some related work. So there's a lot of uh, work, related work for OCR and cuneiform uh, tablets, but uh, I chose those three because they're along the lines of what we did. So DeepScribe is a, is a paper that's going to be published this year, pretty soon, um, by the uh, University of Chicago. Then I will talk about deep learning of cuneiform sign detection with weak supervision. The, this is done by Denka and Björn Oma, who used to be in Heidelberg professor now. He uh, is also at LMU. And I will uh, also mention this GitHub repository, which um, uh, uses synthetic data to do OCR. So this paper I wanted to mention because I think, as far as I know, this is the largest annotated data set for um, cuneiform uh, tablets. The, um, the problem is that they are all licensed, so they are not going to be open source. Um, but the, the, the amount of data is seriously huge, uh, at least for cuneiform, so they have 100,000 signs, but all are from the uh, LME language, so as far as I understand, it's not going to be too useful for maybe Akkadian or the kind of languages that we are interested in, but it still could be useful for transfer learning, and um, so uh, the code and the model weights will be open source, and it will be published yeah, within a couple of months, uh, as, as far as I understand, and the test set will also be open source, so that could be used in the future for transfer learning. The next... Um, it's not a paper, it's just a GitHub repository from 2019. So this is a, the Mask R CNN, which was used uh, to train uh, an OCR model on 20 sign classes. And um, I can show you the synthetic data that they generated. Yeah, right here you can see uh, they use Blender. And um, yeah, it... Uh, it looks pretty good. The, the one uh, weak part is that it's only 20 sign classes that could be extended. Um, but yeah, one would have to make uh, some kind of studies to show that the synthetic data somehow improves the, the OCR. You either have to do, again, transfer learning or you have to mix it with the normal data set to, to show some kind of improvement in performance. So lastly, I wanted to talk about this paper. Um, this is uh, also from 2020. Um, this has... Uh, uh, New Assyrian texts from a specific period. Um, this, it has 80 annotated tablets of 8,000 signs and um, 100, so 86 sign classes, so obviously much more than the previous 20. And um, they showed that they can, with a um, somehow advanced, unsupervised uh, method, which includes somehow the heuristics of uh, the kind of uh, sign shapes and form software, they use the Unicode representation to kind of um, combine this information with uh, previous uh, predictions to, to disregard some predictions. I mean, if you're interested, you can, you can certainly check out the paper. Um, it's somewhat complicated, I would say, uh, but, but they, they show that it works really good. So, um, so here you can see that using this weak supervision or unsupervised learning, they can improve the, the, the performance drastically. So, uh, the, on the section F, you can see uh, 0 0.339 is, uh, is a supervised method and 0 0.656 is method combined with unsupervised uh, weekly or what they call weekly supervision. Um, so one uh, problem that they, this paper stumbled on, uh, which is, uh, I would say, occurring in, in, in uh, cuneiform OCR is that the sign code classes, they follow this kind of exponential curve. So if you would line up all the sign classes by from uh, to decreasing order, you will see that there are some signs which are uh, they are very frequent, and there's some signs that are that rarely occur more than 10, 20 times, even in, in a huge data set. So this makes it obviously very problematic. You will not be able to predict these sign classes if there are only five or 10 uh, training samples. And um, this is also something that, uh, that I was able to to observe in, in the data that we had, and this is something to take into account. Um, you can, for example, oversample the sign classes which are, uh, which are more rare, and to counteract that, um, there are other methods in deep learning that you can, that you can try to, to deal with that, but that's something that, uh, that one has to keep in mind. 
Um, all right, so in this section, I wanted to summarize somehow all the publicly uh, available data. There is a lot out there, but uh, I think it's a matter of uh, collecting it and also making sure that it's publicly available. So I'm also happy to col collaborate with the previous speaker to join forces on this matter because in the end, it's a lot about the amount of data. And I will thank especially Luis, I don't know, there. He's an annotating warrior. Uh, he did like, uh, we can all thank him because without him, then it would be really, really sparse data set. And um, yeah, so he annotated a lot. And um, so this is also a main contribution of us, of him, that uh, we uh, added another 120 fully annotated tablets, um, 80 partially annotated with a total of 70,000 signs. The Heidelberg data that I mentioned before already had 80 fully annotated tablets with 8,000 signs. So we also improved this data by adding like uh, partially broken signs, uh, added another thousand, making sure that the quality was really high. And here uh, I mentioned also some other data sets. So the CDV project right here also has um, around 10,000 signs. Um, yeah, here is the GitHub repository. Um, yeah, you can check it out. It's open source, but the, the problem a little bit with this data set is that you only have the the cropped images. And uh, so it will not be possible to, to localize these signs within a fragment. This would maybe lead into a method where you first do the detection of the bounding boxes and then the classification. Um, I think there are uh, licensing issues, so it's not it, it's probably not going to be possible to publish the the whole photo. I mean, if you would have the whole photo, then you can, you can basically uh, get back the bounding boxes, but um, yeah, and, and the, 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 there's the same issue with, the, with the, this data set from the TU of Dortmund. It's also 10,000 signs, which are um, open source. Um, I, I'm not sure about the language and about the era and if they maybe completely are kind of different eras and they don't, so I just put them all in a data, a data set and trained. But um, yeah, I think that's also could be an issue uh, with the Elamite, I think, language that was one, one issue that it doesn't translate directly to, to Akkadian and so on. Um, there's this project, the Labasi project. So um, the Labasi project we have linked in our uh, sign section right here. They also have a paleography section and they, their data is also going to be um, open source. So yeah, I've been, I've been talking um, to the University of Vienna but there we have the same problem that the, they, they, the original photos will not be published. So again, that's maybe an argument for doing the detection and then doing the classification, um, which I will also come to in a minute. Uh, okay, so as a summary, if you take all those data sets together, you have around 70, uh, 60,000 signs and 20,000 of those are localized uh, within a tablet and 37,000 are only these cropped images. And, um, to put this a little bit into perspective, it sounds a lot, and it is a lot if you compare it to the efforts for OCR from two years ago, which I talked about, like Heidelberg, that 8,000, they still had decent performance. Two years later, we already have 60,000, which is great, but it's uh, still not enough. So um, we have around 500 sign classes. I mean, from what I understand, the Burgas Mesopotamisches Zeichenlexikon is 900. And in our database of uh, EBL, if you count in all the compound graphemes, you end up with 2,500 signs. But a lot of them are very, very rare. It's not going to be possible to train on them. So um, even in our data sets, we can only use 200 sign classes because uh, the rest is so rare that it's not going to be enough to, uh, to, to do proper prediction. So maybe the future data co uh, uh, collection should focus on these rare signs and Composite science that you have mentioned. So, uh, when you talked about it, then I thought actually the smartest thing about composite science is probably to do it each and then together. So, you have both because we did it together and you just have to commit once you decide. But maybe if you have them, have them both separated, then, then, then yeah, you can, you have all the options available. So, um, now make a comparison to a real life. Uh, challenge which is called Cypher 10. So Cypher 10 uh, is a well-known uh, kind of uh, image classification benchmark with like yeah, animals and cars and so on. And um, so they have 100 classes with 600 images each, so 60,000 images. 
and the state of the art top one error rate of these models is around 10%. So um, basically like on 10% they don't get the correct, uh, the correct label. And um, also I would conjecture that cuneiform signs are probably a little bit harder than the cipher data set. So you can imagine we, um, we need much more data because first of all, we have much more classes. We have 200 to 500 to technically 2,500 sign classes. So we would have, yeah, we need still uh, more data, although we already have a lot. Next, uh, yeah, so how would you approach OCR for cuneiform? I and mean, you would, you could do kind of use these models which are used for text scene. So these are models which are specifically for, uh, used for um, text in the wild, it's called. I mean, I have some examples. So for example, this is, uh, th there are these models which are for Chinese text which I would imagine transfers better than English for cuneiform. And um, yeah, so this, this is what they are trained on. These are kind of well-known, well-established benchmarks. Um, and these are the models for English. This is, I think, ICTAR challenge. It's called ICTAR 2015, so it's kind of a challenge. Who can have the best performance? Um, alternate, yeah, so you have the choice. Do you want to do text recognition? So you want to detect the bounding box and, and do the, uh, sign classification in, in one go and you can in incorporate contextual information or do you want to first detect the bounding boxes and then do the classification. I mean, that could be smarter because we have so much uh, cropped images and um, the third route would do direct instant segmentation, object detection um, and not focus on these models which are made specifically for, uh, for text. Um, okay, so now to our uh, contribution, so we uh, added uh, more data and we have now some performance measures on the text detection model and on the text classification model. So the te text detection model um, receives a F1 score of 76. I mean, it's kind of hard to interpret these numbers, um, but yeah, I guess it's all about improving them. And um, I can show you right now some samples uh, of, The, of the predictions that we have for the bounding boxes. I mean, it, it looks better than 67%, but as I said, like these numbers is kind of relative. It's kind of, um, but I would say, yeah, it's, pro it's I mean, it's already looks pretty good from my astrology knowledge. Um, but maybe we can look and find some mistakes. Uh, maybe, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. just to give you kind of a little bit. Explain to us what the, what the red and the green is. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the, the, the green is the, uh, the, the green is the, um, the what is it supposed to be? And the red is what the model predicts. Yeah. Exactly. No, no, this is just the bounding boxes. Bounding boxes, yeah. Um, yeah, I've trained also a model for image classification, um, but I just finished that yesterday, so I'm not really confident that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I report the numbers here, but they're, uh, they are, they should be a little cautious. So um, I used efficient net and I had to stop at 100 epochs because it takes so long and I, I, I get a top error, uh, top one error for, of, 35%, which is, I feel like, pretty good, so I'm a little skeptical, but yeah, maybe. I mean, you, you never know if some uh, kind of things are mangled up or there's some bugs somewhere. Um, yeah, okay. So that's it for my part. I mean, if any of you has data, has annotated data, uh, please contribute. I, I made a GitHub repository, so I'll take one minute to show that GitHub repository. My Google is already. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I will uh, push all the data or uh, make some kind of links to this uh, to this GitHub repository. So um, if anybody has also data he wants to contribute, so this uh, try to collect it here. And one thing that I will mention is, so this is not uh, really done using PyTorch or anything. So this is d some kind of wrapper around PyTorch and you can specify the model in this kind of configuration file. And you can train different, like you can do like this kind of ablation studies, which are well known in deep learning. You can, uh, yeah, specify the specify the um, different models and compare them really easily by this, by these configuration files. And this is the library that, that I use for uh, for setting it up. And you can, for example, go here. And then we can put the links also. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Area. Yeah, and here you can, for example, see all the models and their performances. So on ITAR 2015, and you can see H mean, you can see how they're pre-chained and with, like with these configuration files within a couple of uh, files, you can change the model and you don't have to be busy with PyTorch or anything like that. So yeah, that's pretty good. All right, thanks for listening. And, uh,